All right. Well, good morning, all. Welcome to Clearwater County Regular Council meeting for September the 14th, 2021. I'll remind you that all public meetings are live streamed and recorded. Any verbal or written information provided may be included in public documents as per, as per the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, FOIP 41. It is nine o'clock as I call the meeting to order. Before we get going, I'd like a motion to authorize Councillor Duncan to attend today's council meeting electronically. Councillor Swanson, those in favor? That is carried. Yes. Councillor Duncan, was that an affirmative? Yes. Okay. Welcome to our meeting. Thank you. So uh, we have an agenda before us. Uh, do we have any additions? I have one. I'm going to add 13.2 personnel, verbal discussion as per FOIP section 17. Any other additions? If none, looking for someone to adopt the agenda. Councillor Lang, those in favor? In favor. Thank you, Jim. That is carried. Adoption of the minutes, 3.1 regular council meeting from August the 24th. Are there any errors or omissions? And if none, we're looking for somebody to adopt the meeting from August 24th. Councillor Lougheed, those in favor? In favor. All right, that is carried. That brings us to 4.1. We have a delegation from STARS. Uh, we're looking for a motion that Councilor, uh, Council authorizes STARS Foundation delegate Glenda Farden, I hope I haven't butchered that, uh, to participate in today's council meeting via electronic communications. Councillor Swanson, those in favor? In favor. Thank you. Well, welcome. Uh, we're looking forward to what uh, STARS has to share. We're going to start with a quick round of introductions. I'm going to start with Councillor Duncan. Duncan he's, on the, on the he's on the phone line. Councillor Duncan, could you introduce oh, sorry. Uh, Jim Duncan, Councillor for Division 1. Good morning. All right. Uh, good morning. Daryl Lougheed, Councillor for Division 3. Good morning. John Vandermeer, Councillor Division 4. Good morning. Cami Laird, Councillor for Division 2 and Reeve. Good morning, good morning. Glenda, Councillor for Division 5. Tim Hoven, Councillor for Division 6. Michelle Swanson, Councillor for Division 7. Uh, Chris Free, Chief Administrative Officer, Clearwater County. All right. Well, good morning. It's great to see a smiling face that's going to tell us all about the great things that uh, STARS uh, does in our community. We're very grateful for having uh, such a service as yours. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. I really wish that we would be in person again this time, but unfortunately it is what it is and we will look forward to next year having some normalcy again. And I'm elated to uh, be able to bring you new information and also to always formally thank you for continuing to be a partner with STARS. So I will share my screen and Please let me know if you can see this with critical care anywhere. We can see it. Great. Awesome. So thank you again for our partnership that ensures that STARS can provide critical care for anywhere. The pandemic continues to impact our funding revenue in all areas. Finally, the long-awaited report 
of the HEMS review was released by the government of Alberta and involves several recommendations to include STARS being recommended as the dedicated helicopter emergency medical service provider for Alberta. New air ambulance registration, legislation to come in the province and increased provincial funding. But at this point, these are only recommendations. The government followed with a news release indicating that over the next while, they will consult with other HEMS providers in Alberta before making any final decisions. We have now been advised that the discussions are underway. Are you able to hear me all right? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. The STARS lottery remains the single largest funding source for the <coughs> Because of this, we went ahead with the lottery this year despite a pandemic. We are indebted to every Albertan who participated as this year's lottery sold out, providing crucial operating funds during a devastating year. The calendar campaign has significantly decreased with the inability to travel to the rural communities. So urban municipal partners have offered to help and the 2022 calendar is now available for sale at many municipal offices across Alberta. The pandemic for forced us to think outside the box. We needed to be proactive to support our mission. We identified operational and fundraising efficiencies and sadly had to downsize staff members in affected areas. STARS cannot exist without community support. And we're grateful to many communities who continue to host online 50-50s and travels in place of their annual fundraisers that cannot be held. And please save the date, October 6th, for the upcoming annual Radiothon. Last year's inaugural event was a huge success, and it has led to this year's event being broadcast from 27 radio stations across Alberta. Let's have a look at the mission overview in Clearwater County up to August 31st. Overall, in 2020, there were increasing missions across the entire province. This was also the case in Clearwater County, as the mission rate almost doubled from the previous year. These include critical transfers derived from rural seat calls that subsequently required transport to tertiary care and also pandemic related cases. Clearwater County is ideally located where your residents benefit from the services of two STARS bases, both Edmonton and Calgary. 90% of Alberta's rural municipalities consider STARS an essential asset of their emergency protective services, like Clearwater County, and they provide operational support, support that STARS can rely on. The county sees an average of 42 missions per year, which has already been exceeded with four months left to go. This represents over $300,000 per year in service value for your residents. Emergencies do not always happen when you're close to home. Everyone travels, commutes for work, recreation, or taking kids to minor sports activities throughout your region. When we compare missions flown throughout your municipal neighborhood, the mission rate is staggering at 1,540 missions. And this is in comparing the same time frame. These, any of these missions may include Clearwater County residents. Our partnership safeguards that your residents and your municipal neighbors have access to STARS right here at home, traveling across Alberta or even Western Canada. Our partnership is key. A massive undertaking of a $135 million fleet campaign seemed almost impossible and unbeknownst to us at the time that a global pandemic lie ahead. 
the support we've received from provincial, federal, and municipal governments, individuals, and the corporate sector has been overwhelming. Please know that your operational support is vital to our very existence, and we do not want to compromise that. Some municipalities have offered a one-time fleet gift as an investment for the future. And this accounts for $1.6 million raised from municipalities. If you may be interested, a one-time fleet gift of any size is always greatly appreciated. Currently, we have five H145s operational from Calgary, Saskatoon, and Regina. We recently received number six and seven and pilot tra training has resumed after being delayed due to COVID. Airbus recently announced that STARS is the first to receive the five-bladed helicopters, which will have increased lift and load capacities to be extra beneficial in your complex terrain. We are excited for the delivery of the two remaining helicopters in the next few weeks. Pilot training is scheduled for completion by next spring and we will hopefully be fully H145 operational by fall 2022. With the pandemic still looming around us, STARS remains under strict protocol to protect our operations. STARS transport physicians are committed to continuing to assist rural healthcare personnel with airway management, ventilation, and resuscitation protocols. We continue to see a rise in stress-related types of missions, like heart attack, stroke, drug overdose, and approximately one in five STARS missions are COVID-related. Emergency communication is an immediate 24-7 safety network with access to every available resource, GIS mapping and preset coordinates to locate the patient. STARS transport physicians work behind the scenes to provide medical guidance on all critical calls, regardless of how a patient is transported. The ECC receives over 31,000 emergency requests every year. A new pilot project has been launched with the transport physicians. They are now taking a shift in the ECC. While STARS crew administer critical care en route to the hospital, we can also save precious time on the back end with STARS transport positions to coordinate complex logistical arrangements with the receiving hospitals, such as cardiac cath lab, neurosurgeons, and CAT scanner. In time dependent cases, such as a brain bleed, Minutes count and physician-to-physician decision-making with real-time diagnostics is a game-changer. This is changing the results in immediate direct delivery of a critical patient to the operating room. There are many milestones to celebrate. Clearwater County has played a key role in our life-saving partnership since 1989. You have given hope and a chance for life to thousands of patients. Together, we have built a legacy. You help us ensure a robust health and safety network for your residents with service to all and uphold STARS vision for critical care anywhere with no cost to the patient. Our request is asking for your continued support maintaining your annual standing motion of $2 per capita per year, supporting STARS operations. The demand for STARS continues to rise with the pandemic in addition to the increasing daily demands. Every day, someone's life is saved and this is possible because of you. We thank you for your partnership and hope to continue for many years to come. Thank you so much. All right. Do we have any questions or comments? Councillor Hoven? Nope. That was okay. on from earlier. Uh, I actually, uh, I'll go ahead, uh, Councillor Swanson. Thank you, Glenda. I have a question that goes back to your second slide, and it was in regards to identifying efficiencies. 
Um, you make one bullet saying downsizing staff specific areas effective. Was that because of you did some more um, at home uh, in that like work from home? Is that because of COVID? Is that is that where the efficiencies have come in? Have, have you changed your business model in in the I'll just say in the administrative portion of that? Well, it, it's in several areas. We did identify different operational efficiencies where we could have some cost cut savings, as well as in the fundraising model. Most of the uh, downsizing of staff members was due to we had um, no control over events that had to be canceled. And the majority of that for the unforeseeable future is still canceled. We've had to pivot to online events, cannot hold galas, and that takes a lot of staff that we normally, you know, have had a lot of mainstay events across the province that we could not host any longer. So that is where that part came in. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Lang. Glenda, you mentioned in one of your earlier slides that uh, the new legislation, there was talk about increasing provincial funding. How, mm -hmm. how many dollars? Well, they're proposing that they would rise from the current 20% that we've received for the past 11, um, I think this year is the 12th year at 20% funding, that they would increase to 50-50. So it'd be 50% funding. But keeping in mind that still means 50% fundraising in a very unknown world as we move forward and um, a lot of events that have been canceled for several years now i don't know that you know there is opportunity to revive them so there's still a lot of unknowns but at this time as i said these are only recommendations they have not implemented any of this so we are still at our 20 percent funding right now from government and 80 percent fundraising supplemental so glenda when do you expect to hear if you get this increased funding? We anticipate at this current time with uh, what they've said about, you know, needing to um, have discussions with all the other HEMS providers and things that it could be in the next couple of years. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions with regard to the presentation? I actually have one. Um, I note on your second slide again that you had the pie chart and it indicates that you have 80% uh, comes from other funding sources. Of that 80%, what is the percentage of municipal funding? That would be very interesting for us because I recognize that we're not the only municipality who participates. Currently, we have about 90% of rural municipalities across Alberta, including seven districts in northeastern BC. We have approximately 20% of towns and villages have also approached us now that they want to be a, a part of the municipal support. Um, a couple of cities have also um, reached out. Uh, so. As we move forward, you know, we're just continuing to try to hopefully unite everyone together that we're all in partnership. So currently we are generating approximately just over $2 million per year in municipal support of our entire budget. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what percentage that would be, but it's just over $2 million per year annual support. Well, that's wonderful detail. It'd be nice to have in your uh, pie chart, perhaps in the future, uh, just for reference. Um, I note that you indicated that um, because sales of calendars have been a challenge, that some municipalities have offered to sell them at their front desk or whatnot. Um, how does that process work? Do they simply just offer to do that, or uh, or is that a process that if we were going to do that, or offer to do that, how do we do that? Okay, I did, um, it was with your previous uh, CAO. I did, I did uh, send a letter and ask, but it was declined. So I can resend again and ask if you would like to, we would love to have you to be a, a, an outlet. 
All right. Uh, other thoughts from council? Councillor Lang? I, I'm just wondering if it's declined because of COVID and the public not be able to access the building. Maybe. <coughs> I recommend that you do send the letter forward and we can make a decision based on the letter. Thank you very much for that opportunity. We would really appreciate to have them available, you know, for your residents in the area locally. And yes, I, I understand that COVID has been quite a challenge and so many things have been back and forth, but I would definitely send it. Thank you so much for that offer. All right. Other comments or questions? All right, hearing none, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you again, uh, Ms. I hope I'm saying this right, Farn Farnden? That's correct. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, it's always great to hear uh, how STARS is doing. Uh, I noticed that we have a huge number that happened in Yahatinda this year, so that's interesting and alarming all at once. Perhaps more visitors to our West Country. Yes. Um, so we'll look uh, that, uh, again, thank you uh, for that presentation. I'm looking for a motion from our council to receive the STARS Foundation update as presented and consider STARS Foundation's annual request for funding during the 2022 budget deliberations. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. All right. Those in favor? In favor. Thank you. That is carried. So that includes uh, your funding request as part of our budgeting. Thank you very much. We appreciate our partnership so much. Oh, we do too. It's good to have that service available. Thank you. Okay. Well, I look take... forward to hope to seeing you next year in person. That would be great. Okay. Take care. Thank you. All right, that brings us to item 5.1, crime tracking apps. Ms. Hagert, I see that you've joined us this morning. Indeed. Good morning, Reeve Laird, members of council. Um, as council will recall at their July 13th meeting, you first talked about this when Councillor Hoven gave him a notice of motion following a crime watch presentation that uh, he participated in. Uh, to direct administration to provide a report with information on the Light Catch Ambassador Program. Following up to that, um, as part of the process, July 27th at the regular meeting, Council motioned to direct administration to provide a report on Light Catch Ambassador Program uh, for a mobile crime tracking application and also provide some uh, research into any other sim similar or comparable mobile application options and that the report also included policy and financial implications. Administration uh, did discuss the Light Catch Ambassador Program with its producer, although we weren't privy to the uh, presentation that the Crime Watch Group received uh, earlier in the year. And uh, attached to the agenda item is the email correspondence that followed from uh, Crime Watch in terms of the Ambassador Program. I also just uh, included some media coverage when uh, these started to hit the mainstream back in 2020. Um, as part of the ask and the motion, Council also asked that we do some research into other types of apps that do similar things. Uh, there are not a whole bunch that are universal to the province that we could find, but Crowdsource is one, uh, sorry, Crowd Security is the other one um, by MRF in out of Calgary. And um, they also had contacted Clorida County separate from the ask from Council just to see if we'd be interested in participating in a pilot that they hope to do with the province. Both the apps um, are or use a mapping tool and a crowdsourcing of information as an awareness um, for the public and with the intention of assisting law enforcement uh, across the province in areas where crime is happening. Um, you know, in terms of uptake from the uh, police entities that do enforce the law um, when it comes to criminal activities. Uh, I'm not 100% certain what their take is on the apps themselves, but I, I do know that we have no policy or budget approval that supports the municipality in funding the crime tracking apps at this time. So that's totally up to council's purview if they wish to make that change. Um, that being said, council has obviously in the past uh, indicated their interest in supporting those local crime deterrent organizations such as Real Crime Watch as well, and Clearwater uh, Policing Advisory Committee. Um, 
I think it's evident in their continued appointment to these grassroots groups that council wishes to assist with the rural crime issue. Um, council also has ongoing communications with the local RCMP detachments. We see them at this table uh, several times a year. Uh, we have Rocky Mountain House Sundry and Rimby come and give us presentations and uh, speak with our council in terms of policing priorities that support reducing rural crime within Clearwater County. And um, at a recent council meeting, I know one of the RCMP members indicated that an app like this may indeed assist police uh, in a smaller percentage of instances, but there is uh, some merit to it in that um, there could be limitations too with geofencing and effectiveness, and that could be something developed over time with, um, with the Crime Watch apps and the RCMP directly. Um, and, you, and you know, as part of the process, staff obviously downloaded both apps uh, to review the usage, um, how they work, that sort of thing, but by no means are technical experts uh, making it challenging to provide a recommendation for council to support or not to support. Um, should council wish to proceed with supporting one or more of the crime trapping apps? You can certainly do so. Council would need a direct um, transfer of funding to the emergency services budget from something like contingency, although I didn't ask my partners in uh, finance if there's still money left in that pool, um, in order for that to be part of this year's budget, or alternately, council could consider that funding as part of their 2022 budget uh, approval process as well. So not sure how much detail council would like me to get into in terms of the marketing presentations that were included with the package. Um, the costs associated were noted with each of the um, two apps that were reviewed as part of this process. And I can certainly answer any questions council may have. All right, um, and that actually was gonna be my question is uh, costs associated uh, with the two different apps. Sure thing. Um, so with the Light Catch app, there was two options, option one and option two. I'm not sure, maybe Councillor Hoven, if you can speak to Crime Watch's perspective on which option they were considering when you had your meeting, if there was an option they were considering. Um, but the first option was 22,500, of which 2,500 would be directed to the Crime Watch group to do some work themselves um, for in-person and public events. So that was 22,000 for option one. Uh, option two for the ambassador program for Light Catch was 18,000. Uh, and the details on those were in, yeah. Oh, Tracy Lane, if you wouldn't mind scrolling down uh, just to the next page. The very bottom of the next page. Yeah. That just provides an overview of what, um, ooh, yeah, there you go. What each of those options were in terms of service delivery. Councillor Hoven. From the Crime Watch perspective, we've had uh, two meetings to discuss this. And I, the Crime Watch Association and myself wish we had a little more information on what exactly the ambassador program is and how it's implemented. And I think part of that issue is, is this gentleman is trying to set up this light catch app. It's uh, kind of being made up as we go along as he's trying to see how it works. People. Between the two apps, the Light Catch app is, from my knowledge, more widely used in our area with more people using it. I like the price point on the Light Catch app much better than the other one. Um, so I, I think it would be very, it would be too early to say, let's alloc alloc allocate funds today for this program. But I would really be interested in seeing this council having it added to the budget 2022 deliberations and give administration more time to figure out exactly what goes into the ambassador program as well as figuring out the best way to implement it. I think it would be option one would be better to partner with a local nonprofit group. Um, I don't know if Crime Watch is physically set up for hiring and hiring contractors or staff to implement the light catch ambassador program maybe there's another local organization who could do that i have noticed in the last couple of weeks after after the getting the, the feeling of the community that crime had really lowered down over the past year or so with covid 
I'm getting vibes that it's starting to be on the rise. Caroline Meats was just broken into two nights ago. I'm seeing a few more reports of stolen vehicles. I think it, we do need to make an investment or we do need to investigate making an investment in this program to assist the local RCMP in uh, and, and helping our residents to deal with the crime issue, which I hope is not coming back, but we need to be prepared for it. So I'd like to make the motion that we add option A to the budget 2022 deliberations. Or option one. I For the light catch? Yes. Okay, so we have a motion. Councillor Lang. I guess I have no problem with the motion, but I am kind of a little bit confused because I've had light catch for a year on my phone and it's free. And any time I talk to someone about crime, I tell them about light catch and they usually put it on. So I'm just not sure why it needs to be funded. And it is through a provincial matter, the RCMP. Councillor Hoven. The light catch program, the ambassador program, and, and like I said, I wish we had more concrete details from the light catch people, which is why I'm asking admin to investigate it more. It would be effectively hiring someone in this ambassador role to go around to the communicate community, educate people on how to install the app, how to use it. And then also there's a, a level of coordination at that local level that this ambassador would be in touch with the RCMP. He would get the uh, updates. He or she would get the updates out on the app faster because there is an approval process that has to go through administration. So it is just a way of increasing the importance of the posts that would come from this local area. And if you look at the data that Light Catch did provide, there is an increase in the efficiency of the program if you have that ambassador role fulfilled, either locally or through Light Catch themselves. All right, other questions or comments with regard, regard to the motion? Perhaps we should have the motion just reread back. That would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> that council considers op the light catch option one cost to the 2022 budget. All right, thank you. Councillor Hoven, did you have something additional? I have nothing else to add. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Lang? One is the regular light catch program where option two is the ambassador role. And I thought it was the ambassador role we were interested in getting funding for. Councillor Hoven. Option one is the ambassador role through a local nonprofit group, whereas option two is the ambassador role through the company that organizes the Light Catch app. Light Catch app. With option two, from my understanding, any training for the community would be online. And with option one, if you had a local ambassador, they would go out to the Evergreen Hall and do the training for people who are unfamiliar with technology and unfamiliar with the app. Thank you for that clarification. Um, from what I see, it's an opportunity to further involve our uh, local crime watch group and perhaps engage them further in, I guess, looking into this and helping educate others on how to, how to use it uh, locally rather than electronically through an, another another virtual opportunity <laughs> we've had many all right if there's no other questions those in favor in favor that is carried seven zero all right that then takes us to rma resolution 18-20f on 5.2 ms hager thank you Government of Alberta hosted a virtual engagement session on August 25th with Council may already be aware of. Uh, it was focused on implementation of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta Resolution 18-20F, um, which was, it, 
at its uh, base point seemed fairly benign in terms of a resolution that asked for more municipal control of decisions on fire bans within hamlets that are located within the province's forest uh, protection area, or FPA. And a copy of the resolution 1820F is included with the council agenda item um, as a link. And uh, I also included an attachment with the Government of Alberta's discussion paper related to the resolution and how the, the intended plan to implement the resolution or the intent of the resolution. Uh, I think following that um, Government of Alberta presentation in August, elected officials, including our Reeve Laird, um, expressed concerns with the scope of the proposed changes to the, the Forest and Prairie Protection Act, which uh, government representatives indicated were required in order to implement the change as requested by the RMA resolution, um, essentially linking the responsibility for the lands would have to be transferred to the municipality in order for the municipality to be able to control that fire ban system. But those changes that were included in what hap would happen within legislation didn't just include the ability for municipalities that have a hamlet in the FPA to have control over whether we have a fire ban or not in that hamlet, um, but it, it also included uh, responsibility for fire permitting. If we're gonna have a fire ban system exclusive, uh, Clutter County currently doesn't have a fire permitting system and wildfire firefighting within the FPA hamlet, which we also, um, we have the Wild and Urban Interface firefighting we currently have responsible for, responsibility for, um, but not the wildfire firefighting. And um, there was question around whether the fire originates in the hamlet, whether shifting to the outside of the hamlet, if that fire then is the responsibility of the municipality to fight into the FPA, because we are a controller of the um, fire ban system with that proposed legislation. So following the elected officials feedback on the call, representatives noted um, that they expected the <coughs> change process for the uh, Forest Prairie Protection Act to slow down or stop. Obviously the feedback received from their engagement indicated that that wasn't the, the intent of the resolution nor the will of the majority of the people I would say on the call. Um, but they did say it certainly would be advisable for councils to uh, send a letter to reinforce their position to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and the Minis Minister of Ag and Forestry. Um, since I wrote the agenda item, I also spoke with Wyatt, um, who was the RMA representative on the call, and just chatted with him and said, you know, where's the process at to date? And he did say that Ag and Forestry indicated that this option is obviously off the table that there's still a survey that's open for municipalities to provide their input till September 15th, but that it's likely not to proceed into the legislature, but a letter wouldn't be, um, would do no harm to reinforce Clarita County's position. So um, administration also prepared a draft letter, which um, is for the Reeves signature, should council wish to uh, support an opposition to the proposed changes. Uh, and I will leave it for that council table to determine. All right, Councillor Hoven? No. <laughs> um, I did participate uh, in this particular uh, meeting. It was interesting to see the shift that the legislation was going to create um, by then shifting, I would say, full responsibility onto the local municipality, including um, all prevention and suppression activities and costs therewith. I believe the actual intent of this resolution originated with the municipalities wanting to be able to put on fire bans prior to waiting for a ministerial order, which can take quite a bit of time. Uh, and I think that that was lost in, in the resolution and the messaging. So I think if we put forward, I know if we put forward a letter, at least we will have had an opportunity to state where we, where we stand on this. Um, Nordeg is our hamlet that's well within the forest protection area. I could well imagine having to f fund and budget for full-time staff because of this change in legislation. So this is well worth a motion uh, that council um, review that resolution and the discussion paper, and we direct uh, the letter to be sent to uh, Mr. Dreeshen, 
uh, Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, and uh, Mr. Minister MacGyver for Municipal Affairs, noting our opposition to the pro proposed changes. I did fill out the survey as well. So I'll make that motion. Are there any other discussions? Seeing none, those in favor? In favor. All right, that is carried. All right, thank you, Ms. Hagert. All right, we are up to 6.1, the draft revisions for the fleet and equipment replacement maintenance for public works. Do we need a moment or are they here? Mr. Reed? We might need just a moment, Reed Laird, if I can All right. make your uh, Why don't favor. we take a 10 minute break? Thank you.
All right, we'll uh, resume uh, carrying forward with item 6.1, the draft policy revisions for the fleet and equipment replacement maintenance, uh, Public Works 1003. Mr. Magnus. Good morning, Reeve Laird, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer Council. Again, I'm Kurt Magnus, Director of Public Works Operations, and with me today is Scott Bertel, Clarewar County's Fleet and Equipment Supervisor. Administration is currently in the process of reviewing policies. Specifically, Clearwater County recognizes that efficient use of its fleet and equipment is crucial in meeting Clearwater County service levels. Hence, it is the intention of Clearwater County to establish a financially responsible and compliant approach to managing this resource. As such, this will be achieved through the application of current best management practices coupled with the original equipment manufacturer's recommended maintenance along with current industry standards and interprovincial and federal trade agreements. As a result, staff has drafted an up-to-date fleet and equipment replacement and maintenance policy, keeping in mind the aforementioned. Conversely, given the up-to-date policy, staff is recommending that Council rescinds the March 13, 2001 vehicle maintenance and replacement policy. Also that Council reviews the Fleet and Equipment Replacement and Maintenance Policy PW-1003 and considers adopting the policy as presented effective today, September 14, 2021. I will now turn it over to Council to move forward with the given recommendations. Thank you. So why don't we start out with the motion uh, number one that Council rescinds the March 13, 2021 Vehicle Maintenance and Replacement Policy. I would like to make that motion. Councillor Hovind. Thank you. Any questions or comments with regard to that? Seeing none, those in favour? In favour. Thank you, that is carried. The second motion uh, sits in front of us that Council reviews the Fleet and Equipment Replacement and Maintenance Policy for PW 1003 and considers adopting the policy as presented effective today's date, September, September 14th, 2021. Councillor Hovind. Thank you. Any uh, discussion or questions with regard to that policy? Mr. Reed. Uh, Reeve Laird, my apologies. For clarity, uh, the motion that we would request would actually read that council adopts the policy as presented. Uh, motion to consider adopting uh, isn't as strong as the language we'd like to see. Okay. Uh, thank you. Would you consider that a friendly amendment to your motion? Councillor Hoban? Yes, I would. <laughs> All right. Questions or comments? All right. I actually have one on page 74 of 211, number eight. It says to ensure director public works operations will uh, include funds in the county capital budget for vehicle and equipment replacement. How does that work for our shared services? And I guess in particular, I will say the uh, regional fire rescue, does that then become an addendum to this? Because I know they have to budget their capital budget as well. Uh, perhaps I'm over complicating it. Perhaps you could give me some clarity on how that would work the way this is written. It's all funded through public works. No. Um, question, Revelaire. There is a separate policy currently in place that pertains specifically to emergency vehicle maintenance and replacement. So, in regards to uh, uh, that particular point, that we would have to refer back to that policy. All right. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Mr. Hagen. Thank Welcome you, back from holidays, by the way. Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, just from a budgeting perspective, 
what I would suggest the process that the county follow is to budget 100% of the purchase and capitalize that piece of equipment. And there would be an offsetting recovery from the partners uh, for their share of any of, of the funding that is coming from them. So in total, we've accounted for both sides of the equation, but we've lended the transparency of seeing the complete transaction there and at the same time recognize the full cost of the asset going forward. So I think that accounting approach should meet everyone's <coughs> partners as well as ours. All right, thank you. I was rather curious how that was gonna work given we have partnerships involved. In point number five, it says to ensure department directors will assign the vehicles, should it say directors or designates? I just imagine that there's probably designated people that the directors get assistance from. And then on point number 10, it's just a clarity uh, for where it says that uh, to ensure that Clearwater County has a transparent, honest, fair process for awarding equipment tenders. Have we not been using whatever it is? I believe it's called SourceWell. How does that work in that statement? It doesn't appear to, it doesn't, there are two different things in my mind. Uh, no, uh, in act, so how I would respond to that, everything goes out to tender and uh, via APC and through RMA's source well or procurement tendering process. So that covers it off. And the fleet and equipment management plan in itself outlines the procedure associated with tendering, which includes source well through RMA. So just for my understanding, when something, when you say everything goes for out to tender, we actually, <coughs> Every piece of equipment, full stop, goes for tender regardless of source well? Either through source well or through our own means in-house in where, where we have our own tendering process set up as well. So sort of, you know, your push mowers, things like that, we'll just go out to local suppliers and that's code. But other than that, everything goes out to tender. And we utilize source well to the best of our ability because they are recognized and are... Uh, are scrutinized, I can have Scott talk to a little bit more on it, but uh, either through that or our own tendering process. Perhaps just for my mind, you could explain a little bit more about how SourceWell works. That okay. might be helpful. I'll turn that over to Scott. <clears throat> Mr. Battelle. Good morning. Welcome. Yep. <laughs> uh, so SourceWell, RMA has partnered with SourceWell. And actually, RMA is actually taking it a step further and actually doing their own tendering. So they'll do a proposal, uh, submit bids, and actually do their own tender process, taking it a step past the source well. Um, basically, source well, where that, the biggest advantage to that is when you've got a, a piece of equipment that's extremely complicated, we're going to say a fire truck. There's very, I mean, you can have so many different options, you know, with that piece of equipment. And SourceWell just gives us a way to streamline the process, simplify the process. And I mean, if it's a simple, say, a greater tender, uh, we might go out on Alberta Purchasing Connection and do the process that way. A greater is a fairly simple piece of equipment where the source well gives us that option to work with the vendors and, and, and end up with a piece of equipment that's gonna work well for the county, so. Thank you for that clarification. It's always good to better understand how that works. Other questions or comments? seeing any so we do have a motion uh, on the floor from Councillor Hoven uh, to accept uh, that policy as presented we did have a minor amendment uh, to it so we may have to have another friendly amendment to the motion um, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer yes in the in the uh, 
presentation, there was a comment that uh, we use source well, use RMA, but we also use our own tendering process sometimes. So could you just uh, advise us on, uh, on uh, the process used to decide uh, which tendering process you use? When do, when do we use our own tendering process as opposed to uh, source well? A uh, good example would be for, say, a pickup truck. We would uh, put out our tender on Alberta Purchasing Connection and, and do that process. Supplemental. So I'm to take it from that that uh, if, if it's a simple item, if it's the smaller, simpler items, we uh, would, would uh, perhaps often or sometimes use our own process. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. Hagen. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I can add to that from a procurement perspective. Um, my understanding would be that uh, where efficiencies could be gained for the county uh, based on some of the preliminary work that Sourcewell has done that we can take advantage of, that's where it makes sense for us to, to take advantage of that service that's offered. As Mr. Patel uh, <coughs> described, what Sourcewell offers us is the opportunity to essentially have some of those steps in the tendering process taken care of already for us, particularly where it's a complicated or highly specified piece of equipment. Um, that saves us the work and the time going through that and can speed up the process for us and save the county some money um, while still meeting all of the legislative requirements around tendering. Uh, Sourcewell still meets those requirements, it's just they've done some of the preliminary footwork for us already and gone through and gleaned through those specifications for things like fire trucks and so forth. Um, and then we can pick up from that point and go forward and, and realize those efficiencies. Okay, thank you for that clarity. Councillor Lang. So I just need some more um, clarity on the example of the pickup truck, for example. So if it goes through source well um, or RMA, do our local dealers get a chance to put in a tender? They do? Yes, it's a... Uh, uh, as per legislative requirements, it's put out um, through Alberta Purchasing Connection and, and all of our local uh, dealers are, are well aware of that and uh, it's a fair process so they do have the opportunity to submit their bids as well. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions or comments with regard to this policy? If there are none, um, we would probably need a slight amendment to include as amended to your motion, Councillor Hoven. I would like to amend it. All right. If there are no other questions, I believe that it is reading that we would accept the fleet and equipment replacement and maintenance policy as amended and adopt it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Those in favor? In, fa in favor. That is carried 7-0. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. That brings us up to 7.1, the second quarter 2021 financial report from Corporate Services. Mr. Hagen or ah, Ms. Shurhan, there you are. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Looking forward to hearing how great we're doing. Yeah. Rhonda Surhan, Manager of Financial Services. And Finance is providing a brief summary of the second quarter financial report. Council will notice that this report's report differs from what has been seen in the past, and this is to align uh, more closely with the reporting Council saw during budget deliberations. Uh, one of the noticeable differences, and it was um, pointed out uh, at budget time, and again, um, Mr. Hagen was 
um, alluding to that fact earlier today is that we're um, putting um, all of the revenues separate from the expenses. So even if it's going to offset a cost, um, it's not being shown in the expense as a net. It's being shown as the revenue separate from the expense. Uh, <clears throat> this is more transparent in that the transactions are noted in their entirety instead of the net result. And the other benefit is knowing uh, if these programs are being utilized and to what extent they're being utilized. The other is that programs of council, council administration and the office of the CAO has been separated out of corporate services. Public works is still itemized together. However, there are two distinct areas, those being operations and infrastructure. So moving to the numbers themselves, um, in the operating report, overall revenues are higher than expected to the end of June, and there are a few items to note here. Um, facilities income is up. Uh, there were some new rental contracts in 2021 that have increased the rental income in 2021 significantly. The tax revenue is above budget, and there are two reasons for this. One is that the revenue sharing agreement amounts have not been paid or will not be paid until the third quarter when the majority of the tax revenue is collected. And the other is that there is budget allocated for some tax write-offs and these aren't analyzed until year end. Economic pressures seem to be easing and collection on some older accounts has occurred. Oh, I apologize. Councillor Hoven. Could you, I'm just gonna go back a, a step. Can you give us an example of some of the new rental contracts that have increased the facilities income? There were some lots rented out in the industrial subdivision at Caroline. Okay, thank you. Clearwater County received a recreation grant from the province for work remaining on the Nordegg Trail that wasn't budgeted for, and lot sales in Nordegg are up significantly over budget already by the end of June. Would it be possible to get the numbers for two and four, or three and four? Yep, the recreation grant is for 920,000. Um, lot sales to the end of June were at approximately two and a half million dollars. Thank you. Operating expense, uh, no more questions on revenue? I'm going to move uh, to the expenses. No, thank you. Uh, the expense balances are more or less where we would expect. Uh, however, there are some items to note. Most of the operating programs begin once the appropriate weather and environmental conditions support them. Clearwater County, being in central Alberta on the eastern slopes, has unpredictable weather patterns. May, until the snow flies, is sometimes longer than others. However, we only get what we get. This report is to the end of June, therefore some of the programs appear to be under budget, but this will change, especially with all the nice weather received over the summer with the next financial report that you will see. The other item that always affects the variance in the budget is the regionally funded programs. When a partner is managing a program, Clearwater County doesn't pay for those costs up front. Once actuals are completed, an invoice is received for the county's portion and the appropriate percentage is paid then. Likewise, when Clearwater County is the managing partner, we bear the expenditures until the end of the year and invoices are sent out once actual costs are tabulated. So on to specific um, expenses. Uh, broadband budgeted for operating expenses and to the end of June has only had capital expenditures. GIS budgeted for a flyover uh, for updated photos and this project is still being explored. Communications added additional staff in the budget, but did not hire for this position until August. Although planning appears to be under budget, there are some items using financial resources in the second quarter to be aware of. The largest of this is the legal bills that are accumulating in planning that may require a budget adjustment in the future. The other is that additional planning staff were not hired as quickly as um, anticipated and staff have now been added in that department. Just one question. Yeah. 
there appears to be a delay for some reason. Was it a difficulty because of COVID? What was the delay? The delay for which? For hiring? Um, in the planning department? It sounds like, yeah, there was yeah. a bit of a delay. So there, the, the recruiting process was just a little more challenging than sometimes. Okay. The election portion of the legislative services budget will be utilized more once we are closer to the election. <clears throat> Any other specific questions on the operating expenses? I'll move to capital. Uh, overall capital has been expended to 25% of the capital budget. This is below budget if it is spread out evenly over the year. However, many of the large equipment items are ordered and take time to arrive. So these expenditures can happen all in one quarter. Uh, the large capital projects take time to get into full swing and then with invoicing delays, the impact of what is happening doesn't show up until usually the third quarter report. Uh, Ms. Sharan, what is the red supposed to signify on the on the page. Yeah, so um, those are kind of, I don't want to say revenues, but so on the, the first red is uh, money coming back in. This is an example of where we're showing the expenditure, the full expenditure in fire, and then the sale of the old fire assets. Um, so that's the revenue coming back in just so that you can see the, the whole transaction instead of the net amount there. Okay. And also um, a large portion of the emergency services budget was budgeted for and expended in the previous year. But for transparency, we wanted to show that the, even though the unit wasn't totally purchased in 2020, that it was still ongoing and it was still a large amount. Um, and then the next line is just taking out those 2020 transactions out of that total uh, project. So I think there was two or three pieces of equipment that were started to be purchased in 2020 and um, will be finished in 2021. So again, that's the 2020 um, portions of those unit purchases. And again, further down the page, those are the revenues that are coming back in for equipment sales or vehicle sales of the old equipment. Again, the second quarter financial report for capital is hard um, just because of the, the early um, date for uh, most of the infrastructure projects that are ongoing by June, there's not a lot of invoicing coming in. And if we've ordered equipment from uh, the December, but the budget being passed in December and moving forward in January, sometimes by June, the equipment hasn't arrived yet. One of the other changes is that finance is going to be attaching the operating reports monthly to council's uh, agenda. And uh, for the next council meeting, we will attach the seventh and eighth month of operating reports. <coughs> the third quarter operating report will be finalized in October and um, capital will come then in October with the third quarter. And we will look at attaching capital um, reports monthly as well. All right, any questions or comments? Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Uh, yes, I'm looking at uh, a line for capital, uh, corporate services capital. Yes. Showing year to date at 3.4. Uh, the budget total is 12, yes. roughly. Uh, and I know that, of course, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, a lot of the expenditures are yet to physically happen. But I would believe that uh, the con contractually, you're very close to either issuing contracts or uh, doing things. So 
my question is, um, uh, is that budget is that budget going to be expended by year end based upon your knowledge today? Knowledge today, or uh, will it only be partially uh, expended? I'll let Mr. Hagen answer that question. Mr. Hagen. <laughs> Thank you, Reeve. Uh, corporate services, um, specifically information technology, because the largest portion of this amount that you're seeing here is the broadband initiative. And uh, they are currently um, actually executing those construction contracts. Construction started yesterday on phases two and six of the backbone project. Um, so we'll start to see those actual expenditures probably in the September month end reports. Um, as to the extent of those expenditures this year, we're currently analyzing those and I've asked the department for projections on that in preparation for next year's budget. So I would suggest that um, with respect to the monthly reporting that Mrs. Sirhan has referred to, is that will start to be part of the information coming forward is the departmental projections on these these amounts. So I don't have a projection for you today. That's currently under analysis, and we will be bringing that forward in the next couple of months as well and, and bringing council up to date on where we expect to be by year end, which will go hand in hand with planning for next year as well. Okay, thank you. I might just add too that those contracts will are weather dependent also, so even with the projections, um, it's still just, you know, speculation until we find out how long the construction season will last. Other questions or comments? I actually have one on page 80 of 211, um, and it falls under planning, and the other one falls under subdivision development appeal board. Um, I'm looking at the budget used in relation, and it's showing 230%, and the other one is 373%. Perhaps there's an opportunity to further clarify what, what's happening in those lines. Can you bring that page up, Tracy, please? She, she has it up. If you look under uh, 6 1. Oh, okay, yep, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> I was looking under planning, and of course it's not there. Oh, those are the revenues. That's revenues. Okay, so that is where we're having. Yes, yeah, so the subdivision of revenues of 7,451. I'll have to look into that one. I'm not 100% sure what that is. What's that, Christy? Okay, it might be an error. I'll, I'll have a look at that. And what was the other one, sorry? Uh, the one above that, the under planning. Oh yes, so that's the lot sales in Nordic. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we're looking for a motion to receive Clearwater County's second quarter for 2021 financial report as the information as presented. Councillor Swanson. Seeing no other questions or comments, those in favor? In favor. That is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. That brings us to the Planning and Development Department 8.1, Nordic Development Plan Updates. Oh, Mr. Reed. Uh, thank you, Reeve Laird. As that presentation is going to be um, delivered on right. Zoom at 11 a.m., right. could we uh, request to bump to item 9.1 and continue on with the meeting until that presentation? Very good point. Thank you. We'll head on over to 9.1, the CAO report. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, thank you, Reeve Laird and Council. So item 9.1 is uh, in regards to the Caroline Seniors Housing uh, Initiative, uh, where, um, and uh, so I'll start with the staff recommendation that Council consider two recommendations made by the Clearwater County Village of Caroline Intermunicipal Collaboration Committee meeting. And the background is the community leaders from the village of Caroline, the Caroline Chamber of Commerce, Caroline and District Recreation and Agricultural Society, uh, no, colloquially known as the group, initiated the Seniors Housing Project proposal in July 2020. And the county, as well as the village of Caroline, did uh, fund Sam Smalden uh, of Keys to Housing Communities uh, to conduct a Seniors Housing Needs Assessment. And council received that report in June and the summary indicates that there is quoting uh, enough demand originating for outside the towns of Rocky Mountain House and Sundry to warrant planning for additional seniors housing options in Caroline and recommends that the potential for market rate rental or condomin condominium units in Caroline be further explored um, and so based on this assessment the group's continued support of the, mis of the proposal Mr. Smalden has presented an offer, uh, a, a present a proposal rather, to assist with moving the project forward by immediately developing a project plan, including conceptual design, work plan, and business case model. And that estimated cost for that plan and development is $50,000 and would be expected to be completed within the next three to six months um, to enable this project to be ready for potential provincial fund capital grant funding should it become available. Um, the proposal includes housing units for supportive and assisted living at four different levels. There are many factors to consider when developing this type of senior living community, uh, such as uh, provincial legislation regulations, the role of senior housing authorities on future housing development, role of municipalities in service delivery, including current programs and existing policy framework, uh, regional partnerships, Current funding support for existing nonprofit housing providers and community agencies, impact to existing facilities operating under less than full capacity in the region, location of the development, supporting infrastructure, municipal financial resources, healthcare resources. Um, at this time, it's not clear how many of these points would be addressed fully within the proposed project plan study. Um, however, these are the concepts that administration would definitely bring forward in a workshop. Uh, format or uh, as an item as council would see fit. Uh, on an August 19th, 2021 ICC meeting, uh, Councillor Vandermeer, Deputy Reeve Vandermeer moved that the committee recommends village and county councils approve $50,000 to fund a project plan for the Caroline Seniors Housing Project prepared by Keys to Housing Communities that includes a conceptual design, work plan and business case model and that the project plan is reviewed by a third party upon completion. And the second motion was uh, that His Worship Mayor Rimmer moved that the committee recommends that Clearwater County pay 80% or $40,000 and that the Village of Caroline pay 20% or $10,000 of project plan costs. And both of those motions were carried. And so should Council wish to move forward with the ICC recommendations as submitted, uh, the necessary funding we would recommend be allocated from contingency. And of course, uh, I'm open to answer any questions. All right, um, what we would be entertaining is a motion that Clearwater County uh, Council approve $40,000 to fund a project plan for the Caroline Senior Housing Project prepared by Keys to Housing commu uh, Communities that includes a conceptual design work plan business case model uh, that the project plan is reviewed by a third party upon completion and funds to come from contingency. That would be the motion we're looking for, and then we'll have the discussion. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Yes, I'll, I will make that motion. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Any questions or comments for discussion? Councillor Hoven. The question I have about the motion is the project plan, after, the, <coughs> after that plan is completed, it will, be, it will be reviewed by a third party. Who is that third party? I'm assuming that isn't us, it's another independent contractor we'll be hiring, and is that included in the $50,000 or the $40,000? Mr. Reed, That contractor is not determined at this time, um, and it, it is not included in that amount. 
So should council pass this motion, it would, it would, I guess, be understood that that third party contractor, the fee for that would be included in the 2022 budget. You'll, you'll note that Village of Caroline did not uh, mention that third party contractor in their funding either. I will say that this is a suggestion and recommendation that I brought to the table um, because for me, we've already used uh, keys, uh, keys to housing for the first study. This is now a second study. We believe that there is some efficiencies in them continuing, but it is always good to vet work that's done by the same contractor through a third one uh, that gives that sense of comfort uh, in understanding that it's not just one study on top of another study. It's then vetted through a third party. Other questions or comments? All right, we have a motion. Oh, Councillor Swanson. Um, this is just uh, for my curiosity. Do, is there a terms of reference in regards to this that at this point in time in regards to why we're doing this, et cetera? I mean, I know you've outlined um, some of the proposal that includes, but is there a terms of reference attached to this as to who's taken the lead, who's whatever, or is this completely independent? Um, like I'm just thinking as once the project has been, um, or once the study has been completed, the, the terms of reference of, um, yes, we've, we're making a motion in regards to who's paying for this particular project. But I'm just concerned that because we are within another municipality creating a project within the village of Caroline, for example, that the terms of reference of direction for this at some point in time, uh, is that, or is that pre premature at this point? Um, uh, thank Reed. you, Councillor. Oh, sorry, <laughs> reflared yeah, it, ahead. if I may. <laughs> ah, this is a good morning. Um, it's a great question, and I do believe you're correct when you say a little premature. Um, at this time, this would go upon the same uh, methodology that the initial study went on, which is you've partnered to create one result. You have not partnered to create anything further, and at that moment, it would trigger absolutely a process of uh, what are we doing together uh, after this study? Uh, and so your terms of reference would come at that time. Supplemental. Uh, 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 um, would uh, CEO Reeve know when this is being presented as well to the Village of Caroline Council? Is this being sooner or later? Mr. Reed. Uh, I've been informed they will be discussing this at their council meeting on the 16th. Other questions or comments? So we have a motion on the floor. Those in favor? In favor. That is carried 7 0. All right. That takes us to 10.1. Now we're to the CAO report. I kind of jumped the gun there a moment ago. Mr. Reed. Uh, thank you, Reeve Laird and Council. Uh, so we've got uh, a five item uh, CAO report this morning. Uh, first, an update as a result of Council's resolution RES 300 2021. The request for proposal named Design Build Broadband Fiber to the Home Delivery was posted yesterday in the hopes that work could begin as early as October should a successful bid be received. Uh, construction is actually in process for phase two and six, as well as on the main POP, the network operations center just down the road. And you may have seen the large trucks, VAC truck over there, that's uh, to support our POP. Um, do I go through them all or do I wait for questions on each one, Reeve Laird? What no, would you... I, I think just carry on and if we've got something, we'll jump we'll in. ask questions. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, item two, the Alberta Rural Connectivity Coalition is hosting a free virtual webinar on Canadian spectrum policies and how organizations can join the conversation to support rural and remote connectivity. This is on our next council meeting. And so uh, it's a heads up 
if council was interested uh, and council meeting was complete, an opportunity for learning there. Um, I won't go into the details, but Professor Michael McNally of the University of Alberta will lead a discussion on recent trends in the spectrum regulation and how it will impact rural communities. So maybe of note or of interest to all of you. Um, we will certainly have administrative presence there. I think that should work. Uh, Councillor Swanson. Could you look to see if that is a recorded uh, session? And if it is, could you forward the link to council afterwards if we don't get an opportunity to? Absolutely. I mean, thank you. Great suggestion. Item three, uh, you know, always makes me smile, certainly. On behalf of the citizens of British Columbia, uh, Glenn Gallimore, the Deputy Fire Chief of the Kootenai Boundary Regional Fire Rescue, extended his appreciation for the deployment of the Clearwater Regional Fire Rescue Services Wildland Urban Interface, or as we like to call it, WUI team for the uh, Nukip uh, wildfire in Asoyas and Oliver. He was grateful the team's professionalism, professionalism, work ethic, skills, and leadership when successfully completing numerous objectives. Uh, and he wrote, uh, I say this with pure honesty, working with your firefighters has been humbling and one of the greatest examples of true professionalism that I have experienced in my 30 plus years in the fire service. You should be extremely proud of the training and hard work you've invested in. Believe me, it showed and did not go unnoticed. And I would simply also add um, those kudos extend. Certainly, uh, we had our fire chief was there, our, one of our deputy chiefs was there. Um, we received numerous notes, um, numerous sort of comments that they appreciated the efforts that went on. Um, and I think there's also a recognition that the department's um, strength and depth was really also shown. We could send off at one time, we were up to two crews and, and uh, certainly one supervisor. And our uh, services at home in the county were never impacted. Uh, we always had uh, well more than enough members attend calls. And I think it's a real testament to both uh, the foundation that was built a long time ago, but how that regional service has responded uh, in, the, in the later years. And I'm really impressed with that. Mr. Reed, uh, Ms. Sagert. Please pass along our thanks to the members of Clearwater Regional Fire Rescue Services for their continued dedication and commitment. Um, not only have they been able to provide this service at home, they went out into our neighbors in BC and helped them in a very trying and difficult time. And I know that come at a cost to their time this summer with their own families. and. A thanks to all of the folks where they're employed to let them go uh, because a lot of those paid on call firefighters are employed elsewhere. So a huge thanks from our council to that department for your continued hard work. Thank you, Reeve Laird. Um, seeing no other questions, I'll could go on to number four. Follow up work on the agricultural rec recreation facility feasibility study is still ongoing. The consultant has been hired and uh, early in the summer uh, we sent out, uh, the consultant really sent out uh, a really in-depth survey to all of the facilities that would be able to consult us on this and, and inform our decision making. And unfortunately again ongoing COVID issues, responses received to date are insufficient to complete the data, data findings. So consequently the timeline for presenting the research findings to council is delayed. Uh, administration is reviewing the study's timeline with the consultant to see if there's another way to get you timely and accurate information, um, an alternative data gathering process. Um, and I know Mr. Martinson is working diligently to get that quality information that council requested so you can make an efficient and effective decision. Do we have an anticipated timeline when this will be coming back to council? We are very nearly begging now for information. So we're in the final sort of ways of finding any information. So within uh, this quarter, you'll receive either we can't get you anything better or some better information. Um, but anything more accurate, I couldn't, I couldn't speculate on. All right. Thank you. And then, um, we... Uh, in, re in partly in response to some public uh, knowledge that we've gained, but also in response to Councillor Hoven's particular request for information on the municipal election, we've prepared, and off to my left, you will see a fleet of staff. Um, and that's a little bit uh, 
in case there are some really in-depth questions that you might have. But the returning officer election update, um, you will see a lot of details in there. I will just to make it very clear and on the record and for any uh, residents who may be listening, a few of the key elements that I want to highlight. Of course, September 20th, which you may recognize that date for, I believe a different election is ongoing. Uh, to be clear, the federal election is September 20th. Advanced polls have been going on for the last few days. Uh, so, of course, get out and vote uh, for the federal election is a key message. But September 20th is also the close of nominations for our municipal election. And you will notice um, that, that that date is roughly a month before. October 18th is our municipal election. I'm sure that those in the room are well aware, but I'd like to just remind all of our residents that, that of course, voting in municipal elections is the closest level of government that you have. And so it's the one where you really get to meet these seven individuals and really uh, see their operations for the next four years. Uh, a couple of s secondary key points. Enumeration is ongoing. We're at 25%, uh, which is actually pretty good for this stage. Um, I, we could give you more details. Um, and then one key thing that I'm really impressed with is the website and how active and updated and ongoing updated it, it has. Uh, and so, for example, if you go on there today, you'll see we have 18 candidates. You'll see most of them have submitted bios. Uh, some of them are in front of me right now. Um, uh, but 18 candidates, we have sort of uh, more than one candidate in six of seven divisions. So it's looking like a very healthy democratic exercise will occur again on October 18th. And if I've missed anything, did, okay. Um, Ms. Hager. If I can take the opportunity yeah. while I'm here, I don't think Mr. Reed missed anything, but I uh, wouldn't mind. I know you've met Sabrina, the returning officer. Sabrina Walter has been with us since December. Um, and I also wanted to bring uh, one of our newer recruits into the, the council meeting just for opportunity to learn, but also uh, he will be assisting with the voter registration up until the end of the election. So Michael Burton is sitting to my left. Um, and well, so yeah, he'll be a, in the front lobby. I think some members of council may have already met him in passing through, but um, certainly we have some staff on the phones, on emails, uh, dealing with folks who are coming in to pay their taxes and trying to catch them to register to vote at that time. So kind of that captive audience. So. We're continuing to work uh, on the enumeration process and we're just here if there's any questions. All right, any questions or comments? Councillor Hoven. What have been the biggest issues that you've heard about with the voter registration? And have those issues been corrected as we move forward? Um, sorry, thank you for having me here this morning. Uh, one of the biggest issues we've had is uh, maybe a lack of education between the federal and the municipal election, um, which is ongoing process, just um, you know, giving people an understanding of the difference and the different levels of the government. Um, the, other, um, the other challenge we've had is people don't understand, or there's a lack of understanding why they have to register to vote um, and in creating the list of electors, right? They've come in, you know, they've voted for the last 40 years. I pay my taxes to the county. How come you don't, you know, how come we don't have that information at hand? And part of that is also, um, an education piece that we've been trying to, you know, teach teach the residents. So our information has come from GIS mapping, and the other piece has come from Elections Alberta. And so we've merged that information together into the database program. We actually aren't allowed to use the information from the Clearwater County um, that we receive from residents as it's legislated. And so it's there's lots of boundaries and red tape. Um, in place and so unfortunately yes you know people have paid their taxes they've lived in the county for this long but I don't have access to all of that information and so this registration process is making sure is do we have you in the right division do we have you at the right address do we have everybody in your household registered to be on that list so when they show up at the polling station um, it's just a much easier quicker process thank you You're welcome all right, other questions or comments? Wow, 
Nice easy day today. <laughs> um, uh, Councillor Lang. I'm just wondering how the online uh, process for voters to register is going. I know there had been some glitches and I, I myself had a problem and I had to send an email. So I'm just wondering if that's corrected. Um, the inf Alberta is a bit of a challenge um, when it comes to using this database program and as we are the first municipality to use it, um, there are a few, you know, kinks we are working out. Part of that reason is, is because we have legal land descriptions, we have 911 addresses, and then we have box addresses. So the GIS information that we have and Elections Alberta doesn't have all that information and so merging that into the pro program has been a bit challenging um, but we've tried to make it as as easy as possible so that if you had had struggles and you called we would have done it for you on the phone and um, tried to work it through that way so it's 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 the learning pains of a new program um, you know in four years when we come around to using it again um, things will be more streamlined more in line with each other and so it will be it will be much smoother for sure supplemental um, so as I indicated I ended up sending an email mm -hmm. and so i do you reply to those emails so that the people that send an email know that they're actually registered that's a great question. So with the voter registration cards that have went out, um, there has been um, a high volume of traffic, both on the phones for all of the staff here in the main area, as well as foot traffic, as well as emails. And so we are responding to those emails. Um, I am behind. <laughs> I haven't forgot about you. <laughs> um, and, and this is where Mike comes in because he's going to be working in the background and helping me catch up and keep up because um, those emails if you've had some struggles they're kind of in the backside and so we need to finish that off and so you you will get an email from us um, if you emailed and uh, just saying you know thanks for registering um, this is the division that you live in and here's the website so if you want to check out any information about who our candidates are or where to vote uh, locations time polling stations uh, just information for all of the electors so and I assume we'll be advertising in the papers as well when we get closer to the election just for those folks who are going to be wondering where to go and, and where to vote for each division. Uh, Ms. Hager? Absolutely, Reeve Laird. Uh, advertisement is, of course, legislated under the Local Authorities Election Act um, with a certain time frame before the election, so that will likely be in this week's paper for the first, um, for the first is it this week? Uh, last week and this week. Last week and this week. So as, as well as the other mechanisms we advertise, which include our website and social media. Um, so we do hit the three papers that deliver into our municipality as well as um, some of our other ways to push that information to the community. Uh, a little bit different than previous years, we do have with that voter view system, we have the where, where should I vote or where do I vote um, link off of the municipal elections page and if, if residents are aware of their blue sign address, I've, I've tested that process myself, it's quite easy, you plug in your blue sign address and it'll actually tell you where you can vote at the advance polls for your division as well as the all five or six division uh, polling stations that are within uh, their jurisdiction. So it kind of is something new if you, if you know you live in a division, it says it on your voter's card, you got it on your tax notice and you go there and check out where can I vote, it'll tell you the, the polling locations that have your ballots. So. Um, gives people options to just do that check, uh, as well as some of the other tools that Sabrina mentioned, like the candidate portal, the information that uh, previously we wouldn't have had on our municipal website. Uh, I encourage people to stay up to date by visiting the county's website. That's uh, our easiest and quickest way to get information out to the public, along with social media, um, and certainly look at the papers for your polling stations as well. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? Well, thank you for the update. Uh, welcome aboard. I'll say Mr. Mike because I missed your last name. <laughs> yeah, it's Burton, but yeah, thank Burton, you for having Mr. me. Mr. Burton, thank you. <laughs> so uh, again, thank you for the update. And uh, 
hopefully uh, we'll see a great voter turnout and it's great to see the information as um, front and center and transparent as we're seeing it for everybody to see and and look at that's great work thank you yes. given that we have an 11 o'clock uh, this seems like a good opportunity to take uh, a break uh, and then we'll have an 11 o'clock presentation uh, going back to 8.1 
and good to go. All right, welcome back. Um, it is coming on 11 o'clock, and we have a delegation uh, going to and our internal staff as well. We're going to present on the Nordegg Development Plan. So I'm first looking for a motion to allow Ms. Gillum and Mr. Boris to uh, participate in today's council meeting electronically. Councillor Hoven, those in favor? In favor. That's perfect. That is carried, 7-0. All right. Thank Mr. you, Madam Chair. Reyes. There Good we morning, go. Council. <laughs> um, uh, Kim will be leading us off with okay. the presentation. Um, so, Kim, please go ahead. Ms. Gillum, take it away. <laughs> um, good morning. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm sick and trying to keep my germs to myself. So, um, yeah, I'm at home, but I will be happy to present here. So, um, at the regular council meeting on August 24th, we um, well, staff, Jose and myself, along with MPE, Randy and Mike, um, came to council to present the results of the public engagement ses sessions for the Nordic Development Plan um, and proposed some changes and additions to the draft as a result of that. With council's direction um, of working with MPE, we have some um, made the suggested changes to the draft update document and would like to present those to you today. If council is comfortable with the additions and changes, staff would like to recommend that council adopt the um, Nordic Development Plan update document. The final document approved would have the word draft removed from the title page and footer and the maps associated with the document. Um, in your package, you will find a copy of the draft um, Nordic Development Plan update with highlighted sections, which will indicate where we have made changes in addition to the draft update that was presented to council previously. So that's the green stuff in the document. Um, the maps that have been changed and updated that form part of this document are included as well at the end um, there. We only made a few slight changes to the maps just for some clarity from the previous updated maps. Um, and finally, you all to find attach a summary document of the changes and additions made to the draft update as a result of the public engagement. Um, and on what pages you will find those changes. And Randy is going to go over that summary document and um, the changes that we have made. And then um, we are open to any comments or questions and then hopefully adoption of the document. Okay, yeah, that's it for me at the moment. <laughs> Other comments? Uh, do you want to walk us through kind of what we've got in front of us? It's a large document. We've got 95 pages to <laughs> yeah, peruse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so Ra Ra Randy, Randy is going to be doing that. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Boris. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim. And thank you, Reeve Laird and uh, Council for inviting, uh, inviting me once again to speak to the Nordic uh, Development Plan update. It's always my pleasure to, uh, to present in front of Council. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to walk through every page of the document, uh, but uh, what I will do is refer to the uh, table at the end, which I believe is on page 175 of the agenda package. And um, Tracy, I'm just wondering, would it be possible to share my screen? Uh, because I have highlighted it to, to make it a little bit easier as we go through. Would that be possible? Are you, are you able to, can you actually hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. <laughs> so um, uh, would it be possible to share my screen? Yes, uh, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, can everyone see that? The summary of the draft update? Um, what we're seeing okay. is section five How is that? There we go. It says summary of go. draft update after public comment. Okay, so this is, um, again, I, obviously it is a very long document and uh, I think what we wanted to do at this meeting in particular was to go through the, uh, the highlights of the uh, amendments and updates uh, following the public engagement process. 
And I think the update as presented uh, effectively captures the, the excellent comments gathered throughout the public engagement process, and the plan will continue to be a valuable guide in the ongoing development of Nordic. Uh, so I will be referring to this, and it is on page 175 of your agenda package, if, if you do have it in front of you. But um, as you might recall from our last uh, meeting, and presentation, there's about a dozen or so themes, I'll call them themes, that came from the 21 written public submissions and from the open houses. And, and we captured these now in the update document as, as was discussed at the last council meeting. So I'm going to run through some of the key updates in order as they appear in the table and, and as they appear in the document itself. And uh, like I said, I've highlighted the the actual text changes in the table. So that makes it a little bit easier for, for everyone to follow. So update item number one, if everyone can see that, uh, simply a change in the table of contents. To read now, the one section uh, reads now, heritage and historic resources. And that better reflects, I think, the discussion uh, in, in the document itself in that section. And I'll be speaking to that a little bit later. Update number two uh, is with respect to the role of the update plan. And here we've simply uh, amended the, the, the section to reflect the actual public engagement process that was followed, the social media campaign, the emails and web, web page comment forms, in-person public open house in Nordic and the virtual uh, public open houses. And then following that, uh, there was uh, there was some uh, minor amendments that, uh, that the plan text and maps now are revised to capture recent public process comments and to reflect residents' ideas and initiatives that were, were uh, brought forth through the public engagement process. The other uh, four items aligning more with recent council decisions and, and those other bullets were already in the text doc, in the text of the document. So update number three, and this really encapsulates uh, the, the 12 themes that, that kind of came from the, from the uh, public engagement process and comments and council comments. Uh, one has to do with the, the historical context. So it's now reflecting that on the lands of Nordegan area, the important traditional role and stewardship by indigenous peoples, uh, they're more aptly acknowledged in the text and accompanied by a spirit of cooperation going forward. Another major theme that came from the public engagement was the communication strategy. And so the document now promotes uh, the development in, of an enhanced liaison between the county and local residents and businesses regarding planned improvements and future development. Uh, another theme was just the vision and marketing for Nordig. And although the, the document does speak to developing a marketing plan, I think uh, we just wanted to reemphasize the attractive attributes of Nordig and developing a marketing plan is encouraged uh, within the document. Uh, country residential description, uh, there has been some changes to the what was called the CR or country residential description uh, to better reflect uh, uh, what is on the ground now in the town site and to better distinguish between the leisure and residential land uses that have already been developed on the north side of the town site. Uh, the Stewart Street Hotel, there was consideration of up to a four-story hotel that's now in the document uh, in the Stewart Street commercial area, if sensitively sited, and if an elevator is provided to enhance accommodations for the disabled. Another major theme was that came out of the public engagement process was staff housing. Uh, brought forth by the, the businesses in the community. And the document now promotes uh, the creation of a strategy for new affordable seasonal staff housing uh, to build and maintain availability as property values increase and to support small business growth. And then the last, and I'll call it sort of the new theme that was added to the document had to do with the cemetery and a policy is introduced to explore options for an expanded or new cemetery in Nordic or around Nordic. And then the there was also some uh, amendments to the existing statements that were in the document already that summarized the document. 
Uh, the overall land use concept now reflects that uh, the resort commercial area that was formerly shown uh, in the in North Nordic on the eastern edge of the area uh, is now reflected now reflecting the actual ground conditions which uh, where there's leisure uh, residential area country residential area already in place. The road network concept map has been uh, amended and the policies amended. And this again was another theme that came from the discussions. Uh, and that was that uh, safety improvements are a priority along Highway 11 through the town site. Uh, the open space and concept, uh, pathway concept, uh, the policies are now focused. It, there was a focus on, on developing uh, open space and pathway concept plans. And now uh, I think one of the emphasis that we heard through the public process was uh, safety improvements and separation of motorized and non-motorized users in, in the development of these plans. As far as the area recreation map and regional policies, uh, there was also a guiding policy to help safeguard regional recreation and tourism. Uh, and that is now extended to address uh, coal and mining leases by the province in, in the broader region. So that, that's really a, a, a lot of the changes. Um, I'll go through some of the, the others as we go, but uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail with some of the minor wording changes, but if there are questions, I'll be pleased to answer them at the end uh, or as we go through. So update number four with respect to the design guidelines. There are some uh, minor wording changes, but a, a new summary statement was added and a new policy is put forth in this update to continue following the design guidelines with a provision to review and update them on a periodic basis as necessary. Under update number five, it's more of a minor wording change just to avoid dating the plan because there were some references to uh, the, the new sewage system, the new infrastructure in town, and we just wanted to remove the term new just so that it avoids dating the plan. Update number six, uh, under public involvement, Again, this is just highlighting the public engagement process that was followed in the spring and summer of 2021, which started off with the presentation of a draft uh, update to Council, uh, release of the draft to the public and, and stakeholders and Nordic residents, gathering input through the public open houses that occurred in June and the, the two virtual open houses. Uh, plus submissions uh, to the web page and written an email. Uh, submissions. And then, of course, review by council of the received comments that we did at the last council meeting, and then revision of the draft update in where we are right now. And then finally, review and adoption by council of this uh, final Nordic development plan update document, uh, should you see fit and should you agree with the amendments that have been put forth. There was also some discussion at council last meeting, too, about uh, there were a lot of comments from the public about making land use decisions outside of Nordic. Uh, so we wanted to clarify in the document that uh, while the plan recognizes that Nordic is a community within the West Country region with the purpose of providing accommodation services and connections uh, to the broader region, including other development nodes along Highway 11, uh, however, the plan does not and cannot provide land use policies beyond the town site boundary, most of which are provincially owned crown lands and therefore outside of the county's direct jurisdiction. So update number eight had to do with uh, fiscal cons considerations and this had been talked to um, even in the original council discussions that the ongoing development in Nordegg is expected to be carried out in a fiscally responsible manner that is respectful of the taxpayers across the entire county. Update number nine uh, is just a minor wording change. Uh, update number 10 on the historical legacy and uh, discussion uh, recognizes that Nordic is on Treaty 6 territory, uh, traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, place and traveling route for indigenous peoples uh, in, in including the Salto Cree, Stony, Blackfoot, and Métis. And then further in the next paragraph, uh, we continue to recognize that the First Nations camps represent the first habitation in the area, 
uh, being set up along Shunda Creek to take advantage of the rich hunting and fishing corridor. Update number 11 is just more of a minor uh, wording change. Update number 12, again, more, more terminology changing, just updating the term from quadding to ATVing, recognizing that uh, there's different types of uh, ATVs that are using the trails uh, versus just quads. And then also adding in uh, mountain biking as a popular activity. In the second part there, um, one of the things that is quite important uh, that came out of the discussions was an uh, amendment to the, uh, the last sentence in that section um, that uh, resource leases for oil, oil and gas, coal, mining and forestry are provincial jurisdiction, but the county can and should provide meaningful input to protect its long-term investment and keep Northern viable. So moving on to uh, update number 13, economy and tourism, uh, just a recognition that uh, many amenities outside of Nordeg and in the West Country uh, attract people to Nordeg and make Nordeg successful. And again, uh, policy one was amended such that county, county advocate for responsible resource extraction uh, in the region, uh, resource extraction being of course provincial jurisdiction versus the, the original document, which more uh, said just to support it versus to advocate. Update number 14 under public awareness and marketing. Uh, this came out of the, the public uh, discussions uh, that that uh, history and environment are very important to, to marketing of Nordeg and people come for both passive and very active uh, activities and a balanced marketing plan that recognizes both, uh, both uh, aspects uh, and that can highlight both Nordeg's unique garden city heritage and future development opportunities and can promote a wide range of services to people of all ages and abilities. So in that same section uh, under update number 15, there's a policy number two is added to formalize a communication strategy between the county and local residents and businesses regarding plan improvements and upcoming developments in Norway. Uh, item update item number 16 resulted in uh, adding a policy uh, as was discussed previously about um, uh, supporting the growth of small business by developing a strategy to assist and promote affordable seasonal staff housing as the community grows and to preserve affordable staff housing as property values increase. So update item number 17, uh, again was reiterating the regional cooperation aspect and the policy, the term advocacy was added uh, to continue to provide comment and advocacy during provincial resource-based lease approval processes. Uh, update number 18 had to do with uh, more solid waste and, and following Alberta Bear Smart and Bear Smart practices throughout the community and the policy was amended to reflect that. Uh, update number 19 under the environmental strategy uh, policy four was added to adopt ever approve, improving construction techniques and methods that minimize impacts on natural areas, such as using vegetative erosion materials in drainage courses where suitable and avoiding environmentally sensitive areas where possible. And this came uh, from some comments about, uh, you know, the future east uh, access that will have to be constructed at some point uh, very near or across um, Shunda Creek. And that led to update item uh, number 20 also to plan for this future secondary access road to the south town site uh, throughout the southeast portion of the area and to minimize impacts on local wetlands. So item 21, update 21, again had to do with the uh, heritage aspects of the, uh, of, of the document and of Nordeg, and again, uh, showing that it is important, noting that it's important to commemorate, commemorate the heritage of Nordeg and area, recognize, recognizing its history as a First Nations gathering, camping, and hunting site, and later as a colorful mining community. And coming out of that, uh, update item number 22, 
a policy was added to consider input from first local First Nations on appropriate interpretive elements in the community. And then uh, with respect to the heritage aspect and, and the cemetery, uh, to investigate options for an expanded or new cemetery uh, in the town site or the region, recognizing the shallow bedrock in the vicinity of the existing cemetery and the limited land base in area. So update item number 23, uh, we spoke to that, uh, I spoke of that previously, just adding policy number seven to periodically review the architectural and design guidelines. Update item number 24 uh, speaks to the uh, changing of the term land use designations to land use descriptions to better characterize the conceptual nature of the terms uh, versus the land use designation term, which is more used in uh, more formal land use policies, versus a high level plan such as this. Update item number 25 is the uh, changing of the country residential land use description to NCR, so the CR to NCR, Nordic country residential. And again, that's more just to conf to eliminate confusion over terminology with country residential land use districts uh, outside of Norway. And within this section, um, the NCR land use description is, is summarized. Uh, it didn't, it was identified throughout the document, but not necessarily summarized in this section as other land use districts are. So we felt it important to actually include a summary of that. And then these changes are also reflected on maps number seven and number nine of the land use concept map. And then uh, the Nordic commercial, uh, or sorry, Nordic country residential leisure, the cabin lots and the Nordic country residential, residential, the permanent residential lots, those land use subcategories were also uh, more summarized in this section and on the maps. And, I won't go through a lot of the, the detail of this, but uh, just I'll be able to say that uh, the, the actual descriptions and the bullets are identified uh, within other portions of the document and just um, summarized here. And also the land use districts that are already within the, the county's land use bylaw, uh, the, the, the bullets here reflect what is, uh, is in the bylaw currently. So there is a description of the Nordic country residential, the general district here, and then a description of the two subcategory districts, uh, both the residential and the leisure residential. Uh, and again, these are the acreage lots on the north side of Nordic, the residential being the larger two acre lots, and the leisure residential being the smaller lots that are serviced by, by um, uh, water cisterns and, and on-site sewage tanks and where there is a they are limited to seasonal occupancy and then just the last few uh, changes i'll be running through uh, update number 26 uh, deals with uh, the policy again to cooperate with alberta transportation as the community grows to make necessary and timely safety improvements on highway 11 including speed reductions and safe trail crossings. And then update item number 27 has to do with the uh, railway, uh, the former railway station building. And there was discussion in the original plan dating back to 2000 about reestablishing re uh, a building that looks like or, or takes, uh, is inspired, the architecture is inspired by the former railway station at the top of Upper Center Street. And uh, I think what we just wanted to do was to clarify that that building would not necessarily be a railway station going forward, but a, more of a, a building, a visitor interpretive center or a commercial use building that uh, is inspired, the exterior design is inspired by the former railway station. And that's where policy three was amended. So update number 28, um, again, uh, just coming back to the Parks, trails, and open space policies. Uh, policy number seven was added to promote the ongoing development of detailed tra trail and path plans with provisions for both multi-use and single-use trails, such as footpaths, bike trails, et cetera, 
allowing for improved safety, signage, and separation of motorized and non-motorized uses. Um, moving on to update item number 29. Uh, again, that had to do with uh, moving forward. And this has been discussed previously about uh, in, uh, including the design guidelines and support documents in the periodic review of the plans uh, going forward in the future. So just closing out the last two items, uh, update item number 30 is basically has basically to do with the next steps as uh, as Nordeg developments develops and the next steps with this plan. Uh, so the first bullet is to review and adopt this final draft uh, by council to post the plan on the county website with paper copies made available for viewing in the Nordeg library notifying Nordic property owners, stakeholders, and the general public of the updated plan and providing links to the document, making hard copies available, and then implementing this plan in the continued development of Nordic. And the final update uh, was just update 31, inter uh, excuse me, introducing uh, the term ATV. And uh, that's, that's, uh, Generally, that's the summary of the highlights uh, in the in the document, and I'm more than happy to go through any questions that council may have. And I did want to just uh, identify here the plan, and not be so easy to see, but the the amended uh, plan and the north side. This was the the drawing that was amended to reflect the Nordic Country Residential on the north side, and you can see where the leisure and the residential areas are identified. So that's uh, that's it in a rather big nutshell, but uh, uh, thank you for your patience in going through this. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, All right. Well, before we move on to questions, uh, we have a, a staff recommendation for a motion. The council rescinds the Nordic Development Plan dated November 28th, 2020, or 20, 2000. Let's see the easier way for me to and adopt the Nordic Development Plan update dated September 14th, 2021, as presented. That's the motion we're looking for. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. All right. I'll open the floor for questions and comment. Councillor Lang. Has the Nordic community had a chance to see this draft plan? Mr. Reyes? Uh, yes, I believe they have, as part of the public engagement process. Okay. Yeah, if I may, they wouldn't have seen this update. Obviously, we're just presenting it to council um, today with the changes in it based on the comments that were received. So um, they would have it available to them just as you would today. Supplemental. So this draft has, was it posted on the county website for the community to take a look at? The original one was, but not this one with the green updates. It has not been put up. Um, if I could add to that, however, we had uh, the discussion at the last council meeting with uh, updates. So it was a public, it was a, a public knowledge, all those updates. For the last two weeks, they've had access. That's oh. correct. All right, thank you. Do you have another supplemental? Okay, other questions or comments? Are you still with us, uh, Councillor Duncan? Yeah, still here, no questions at this time, thank you. Okay. Well, this has been a long time coming. It's a 20 year old document that we're trying to update. So that's no small uh, feat to get it out into the community. Uh, in a COVID and uh, make the appropriate uh, changes as per uh, recommendations from the, uh, from the community and uh, from staff as well as council. So at the moment, uh, we do have the motion, uh, again, that council rescinds the Nordeg Development Plan dated November 28th, 2000 and adopt the Nordeg Development Plan updated, uh, dated, September 14th, 2021, as presented. That's a motion by Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. 
Councillor Swanson. Oh, sorry, I just, um, if, if we could go back to page 43 and 95 or 129 of 211, it's in regards to the land use concepts. So what you've highlighted in green is a further explanation of the particular like Nordic country residential. Is it just an add-on or what we see there is further ex explanation that, that that wasn't there before? Just, just for clarity. Um, I think I can answer that. It was uh, it's a combination of two things. One is it is an, it is a new section. It's new information, new bullets that are in there. Uh, but it's basically amalgamating the information that was elsewhere in the document and that's already in the land use bylaw. So it aligns both of those. So there's really no new information. It's just put in that section as a summary because every one of the other land use descriptions was summarized similarly. So we felt it important to have that summary there. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. We have the motion. Seeing no other questions or comments, those in favor? In favor. All right. That is carried 7 0. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the staff and uh, Mr. Boris and your uh, compatriots. Uh, for all your help. I recognize that this has been a bit of a journey for all of us, especially given the challenges that COVID has put in front of us. So thank you for that. We'll look forward to next steps and seeing it go out into the community now. Thank you. Thank all you right. very much. And I look very forward to many more uh, enjoyable years in Nordic. All right. Thank you very much. think that that's everything good <laughs> well given that we've gotten through that again thank you for everybody's uh, input I think then we can go on to item 10.2 because 8.2 isn't till one o'clock we oh, are ready sorry. to present if we got time, if you have time I can oh Okay, if you'd like to, that is more than uh, more than acceptable to us. I'm sure of that. All right, I just wasn't sure. I had it as one o'clock, yeah. but if you're ready to go, we we're, are too. We're ready to go. Okay. 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 So eight point two, it is. Thank you. We can cancel. Um, Charmin Pasholka, development officer, will be presented this item. Good morning, Reven Council. Before you is bylaw 111121, relevant to application number 0321, to amend, amend the land use bylaw in order to redesignate plan 0325401, block one, lot one, which is part of Southeast 253097, from agricultural to light industrial. The applicant, Patrick LeBlanc, on behalf of his numbered company, would like to sell the subject property to the existing business operator who currently holds a lease agreement. Development permit 0619 allowed for the temporary operation of a tradesperson's business, a recreation vehicle repair business. The Municipal Planning Commission requested that the property be rezoned prior to review and approval of an additional development permit, allowing for the business to continue operation. The subject property is located within the Rocky Clearwater Inchi Municipal Development Plan area. A pre-referral pre was sent to the town of Rocky Mountain House and they have no concerns or objections to the proposal. Staff is recommending that council grants first reading to the bylaw amendment and proceeds to a public hearing after circulation. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Doesn't look like we have any questions at this time. So we're looking for a motion uh, to grant first reading of bylaw 111121 and proceed to public hearing. So moved. Councillor Duncan, thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
Seeing none, those in favor? That is Councillor Duncan. I in favor, you. yes. Thank you. <laughs> that is carried 7 0. Thank you, Ms. Pasulka. Trying not to butcher it. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Reyes. That's perfect. That got us through item uh, eight. So then we can progress on to 10.2 uh, if we uh, would like to wait for public works or would you like to present on their behalf, Mr. Reed? As this report is fairly straightforward, I'll, I can present on behalf. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Reeve Laird and Council. Uh, so before you, you do see the September 14th public works report and uh, as it is summertime, of course, work continues apace across Clearwater County. Um, and even today, we have new work commencing. Um, so uh, gravel road program well in hand. Um, we're, we're focusing on the northern part of the portion of the county utilizing aggregate out of Frisco Pit. And patch graveling is utilizing the Cooper Pit. Uh, our surfaced roads, um, again, <coughs> continue as weather permits, but on as needed now, we've completed the sort of install part of that work. Um, Nordeg street lights are completed um, and energized and in service. We did some SB90 for Town of Rocky Mountain House successfully, and as mentioned previously, line painting contract has been awarded. Um, weather, but more importantly, the paint shortage has a delay schedule, uh, so we hope for that to happen quickly, but it will happen when it happens. Um, um, just a question here, please. Councillor Duncan, go ahead. Um, you may not have the answer, Christopher, but um, I'm not sure about the deterioration of the paint over the winter, but are we getting to the point, I know we need to repaint these lines because of the different types of paint, et cetera. We have to end up doing this pretty much every year, but if we're getting to the point where we're not getting around to painting until late in the year, is it maybe it's prudent to consider trying to get to be first on the list for next spring as opposed to trying to get it done this fall and then having it deteriorate significantly over the winter with all the salt, et cetera, on the road? Uh, that is an excellent question that I do not have the answer to. Um, I'm, we will send that out by email as, as an answer. I will throw out, though, hazard a, a guess. My suspicion is that we do have an obligation to provide the safest roads we can, and so the sooner is always going to be the better. But the value part of that is an excellent question, and uh, and we will definitely uh, take that back for consideration. Thank you. All right. And so continuing on um, with maintenance, uh, several projects that uh, council is aware of, um, but. Uh, the highlights for me, of course, is that uh, some of them, even for example, the uh, tender for construction of the Nordic Commercial Septage Receiving Station, um, that is scheduled to begin our pre-construction meeting today. Uh, so again, like I said, we're still continuing apace with work throughout the county. Um, that work is expected to be done by Halloween. Um, uh, continuing on, uh, you're well aware, of course, of the development permit application for uh, that went before the Municipal Planning Commission for the South Cooper Pit, the notice of hearing scheduled for September 21st. I'd like to highlight that for any, anybody who's interested in, in that uh, development. Um, uh, continuing on to item four, Clearwater County Solid Waste and Recycling Services. So the landfill cell two development, it's operational and receiving waste. We received six proposals for the metal processing and the successful proponent was Alcop Resource Recycling. Um, the transfer station utilization update, uh, much, much the same, continuing on again with high usage. Um, we're, we're up to 9,000 solid waste disposal access cards, so that's really promising, seeing that residents are uh, jumping at the chance to be uh, able to access those waste, those uh, solid waste disposal sites. Um, a small number of non-regional and regional cards. And then um, as in the summer, we responded to some uh, requests and some requests of council as well to uh, increase the operating hours from 7.30 till 6 on Tuesdays only. And it's working well. That program is working well. We're getting lots of uh, visitors out there to that main site 
on Tuesdays. And we haven't seen any particular need shown with the stats yet that would give us the idea we should do this on another day. Um, uh, some further gravel road rehabilitation. Um, really great progress being made this year. The crew has had, you know, real benefits from that great weather, as well as our contractors uh, with the item seven, the base pave for River Road intersection uh, coming along nicely. That is on schedule. Uh, Leslieville East and Spate Road, uh, I believe. Well, I will just say they're on track. I won't say they're ahead of schedule, but the weather was beneficial to all of those. Okay, just before you go on, Councillor Lang. Mr. Reed, can you tell me if uh, the central transfer site, if the signage uh, outside the gate has been updated to reflect that the hours have been extended into Tuesday evening? I was up there not too terribly long ago, and it wasn't, and I, I thought, unless I misread it, but I thought, well, if anyone drives up here, they're not going to know that they can come a little bit later. Uh, that's a great point. I don't have that answer, but uh, we will definitely verify that it is. Thank you. Councillor Lahey. Yes, just, just one quick question around the, um, the access or waste access cards. I noticed that you reported 9,000 cards have been issued. Is that the duplicates included in that as well? Because many residents get two cards per resident. Uh, just trying to anticipate, or we have almost every resident in Clearwater County with a card, I wouldn't have anticipated that much uptake. So I can't break it down for you that way. Uh, that takes some data analysis that may, I can check into whether or not we can even do that. I mean, it, w it might take a huge data analysis program to, to figure that out, but. I certainly um, don't want to see us put that lev level of energy in. It was just some somewhat surprising to me that we had 9,000 cards out for around 5,000 residences, so. Um, Right, and so residents who may be renters or residents who maybe do want to have more than one card are taking us up on that. Um, and, and certainly we can verify those numbers for next report. Thank you. I guess just before we move off of the solid waste and recycling services, um, when can we anticipate signage and decaling to be changed out? Um, it, you look and we still have the old decals on things and signs out. Uh, I will get back to you on that one. It's, um, it, I know that we have orders in for signs and of course there are delays. So we will see what we can do to expedite that. Great. And just while we're still on the vein of signage, um, a while back, uh, this council approved new signs for the highways. And I, I know that we would have had to get permission and all of that. Do we know when they're going to be installed? So as with the last update regarding this, we, we are at the mercy. And so we, we wait, but we don't have any current information to give you. All right. Thank you. So we, I was on to base pave and just commenting on how uh, the weather was cooperating. Um, there are quite a few things happening in the Nordegg Historic Commercial Core to update everybody on that. Um, the shallow utilities uh, issued for construction and they, the construction crew to start this week, roughly four weeks of work. Uh, subdivision plan utility right of way work, work is continuing with Pomoco there. Uh, staircases and retaining walls have begun. Um, there are uh, certainly some uh, you'll see, if you were to go visit, you'll see some work there, and uh, I don't know when it's going to be finished, but the landscaping is scheduled to be completed at the end of next week, again, weather permitting. Uh, we are currently reviewing the church lot concept plan for the landscaping portion. And the east access road, of course, a hot topic with the gravel trucks. Um, so we're continuing with that preliminary design, and it would as you saw in the previous presentation, two previous presentations, it would create a secondary entrance to Nordeg and also allow that gravel truck traffic straight onto the highway. Councillor Lang. Mr. Reed, just back to the legal survey and plans. 
BEMCO is currently completing the subdivision plan and utility right away plan work. Which subdivision? Like, I thought commercial core or? An excellent question. I believe it's just continuation of existing subdivisions, right? Like the next phases, we're getting ready for the next phases, but I will verify that as well. Thank you. I thought I was uh, completely up to speed and you guys are finding all of the gaps. That's great. Um, so the East Access Road and then the Heritage Centre, of course, and you will remember that we spoke at length about that mural and uh, certainly plans are in place to find a really good way to commemorate that. Uh, but the stucco, I believe all the stucco is down now and the siding has gone up on, the last time I was there, two of four walls and it actually really brings that building. Uh, it's really interesting how it looks new but yet it looks like it's always been that way. It really looks uh, sharp and looks like it belongs that way. Um, and of course the benefits of the insulation and the, and the longevity of that particular product. So. And then you'll see in our, our uh, latest bunch of pictures there about the fencing for the uh, hot selling um, mobile home uh, subdivision there. And SureSpan has begun the work of the deck and rail system and so the Nordic Trail is well on, underway, uh, another 15 kilometer section. And the fire training tower continues to move along in its plan and so the pilings uh, were awarded to Force Cops Piling Inc. and that will allow that, that uh, facility to continue its build. As ever, a reminder of the road bands that still do remain, uh, those three highlighted ones. And then we of course get a lagoon summary report from the, the, our friends over at Town of Rocky Mountain House. And uh, really the summary there is, is uh, that it's operating at uh, successfully as designed. Um, no notices of non-compliance and um, really nothing notable to report in that area. So let's see if, you can, if I can answer any questions that you may come up with now. And I guess for me is just perhaps it's a wording thing and it, it's the last sentence of the, the Lagoon summary report. It says the town is working with Environment Canada, Canada to meet the higher uh, affluent expectations under the federal wastewater system affluent regulation to ensure the town meets or exceeds the highest environmental practices. To meet tells me maybe they're not quite there yet. Is there a way to confirm that? Uh, we have confirmed it. Um, as with last report, there are no issues with that, uh, that uh, lagoon right now. Perfect. The, Thank yeah. you. Other questions or comments with regard to the Public Works report? All right. Seeing none, it is... 10 to 12, do we want to quickly fit in uh, our councillor reports? Sure, I'm hearing, seeing folks nodding. I'm going to start with you, Councillor Duncan. Okay, thank you, uh, everyone. And I will just mention the recreation, or the Rocky Rec Board Committee that we did meet in early September. And just two items of note there is that the one arena has been more or less commandeered for the use of a voting center for the federal election. So it will be a result in a delay in the ice going on in that a second arena, but there will be an invoice going to the federal government for the use of that arena for this time period. They are holding it in use right from the advance polls, which went the last four days, and they will continue to have the arena set up for the election next Monday as well, so it's out of commission till after that point for the next ice surface to go in. Uh, other than that, the uh, recreation survey that was done on the rec master plan, it's, it did receive uh, over 400 responses, uh, most of them online, some of them during the market on Main or, or walk-ins to the town office, people picking up uh, the paper copies, etc. And approximately 72% of the respondents were from Rocky and 26% from the county. Um, the I did see some of the draft uh, responses and but we will be receiving as a council 
a presentation from the town of Rocky Mountain House either at our late September or early October council meeting on on what the what the rec, the rec survey did and come up with. So look forward to that in the future here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any questions or for Councillor Duncan? Seeing none, Councillor Lougheed. Uh Nothing to report at this time. Great. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer. Uh, nothing to report. Thank you. Councillor Lang. I also have nothing to report. Councillor Hoven. The one thing I wish to mention is that the, the county and all the former members of CPAC are reorganizing that committee. It, I, I'm going to call it a casualty of COVID in that it was functioning and then COVID hit and it did not meet for the last 18 months. So the committee and administration are working hard to reorganize that committee, make it more effective as a vehicle to take resident concerns directly into the RCMP. So if there are any residents who are looking to volunteer and assist, please keep your eyes posted in the next weeks for, uh, because we will be asking for more volunteers. All right, Councillor Swanson. Um, I also uh, participated in that uh, Government Alberta engagement policy review that was outlined by Ms. Hager in 5.2. Um, and we went to the Bighorn Rodeo Parade um, on September 4th, which I found a uh, great turnout for that particular community. It was nice to see. And uh, yesterday I also participated in that Canadian History of Recon Reconciliation uh, webinar. So that was it. All right. Last but not least, um, had to go back a little bit in my journal just to figure out what we've been, what I've been up to. So August 25th, uh, that was that uh, resolution discussion uh, that Councillor Swanson and I uh, participated in with regard to uh, potential uh, changes to legislation to the Forest and Prairie Protection Act around hamlets. Uh, August 22nd, I attended TC Energy's. Uh, Compressor Site uh, Community Appreciation Tour, and that was uh, fairly well attended given the increasing numbers of COVID. Uh, it's nice to see that it'll be going online in November. August 30th, um, attended a meeting in Edmonton with uh, the ICISF, which is the PTSD stuff I've been working on um, for the province, which is starting to reach where we're looking at international opportunities, uh, or not international, national. That is the international group that has uh, given us their, I guess, their, mono, their name. <coughs> so that will continue on, and that's for first responders, everything from doctors to um, firefighters and police officers. And they are having a heck of a run on the requests for help for peer intervention. Um, COVID has been a challenge. August 21st, or 31st, we did our workshop on uh, the equipment uh, survey. Uh, we did that together. September 1st, a virtual meeting on, for Industrial Alliance for additional benefit options. I attended that. September 2nd was senior housing. We did a special meeting. Um, we had a personnel matter and uh, we looked at the work that's going to be done on the exterior of the building. Um, we've had to break it down into smaller bite-sized pieces. Um, it's been difficult getting contractors, and it's been difficult getting uh, supplies. <laughs> so uh, I can appreciate why uh, public works and other departments are struggling. September 2nd, I also attended uh, West Central Stakeholders' uh, first in-person meeting in Leslieville in a year and a half. It was uh, good to get together. Uh, basically, it's business as usual, not much going on for drilling, etc. It's Everybody's just sort of holding and waiting. Um, we've got just a couple projects. September 4th, I, again, we all were at the Caroline uh, Bighorn Rodeo Pancake Breakfast and Parade. And September 8th, the healthcare professionals uh, attended that. So some interesting discussion around funding for um, a three-month term for a nurse and where she could stay. Uh, 
it's going to be a challenge looking for because the condo is already being filled with a doctor locum so this uh, nurse is needing a place to stay and they're looking for funding uh, it appeared more to be a, a discussion around do we fund it or should it be an AHS thing seeing as how it's an AHS employee uh, due to COVID numbers on the rise, our hospital <coughs> temporary bed closures is now back up. We're at 31 beds. Um, they have reduced surgeries down to only 30%, and they've moved OR nurses over into ER. So um, we're utilizing those nurses slightly differently. On September 9th, uh, we had, I attended a uh, virtual meeting with the government with regard to aggregate pits and the uh, municipal and provincial processes in the working group and when I it didn't appear to be new information they are looking at some different ideas of doing that when I uh, had a conversation with Mr. Magnus after that he said this is business as usual we're busy doing what that stuff already so uh, that was nice to know we're already on top of it September the 10th, uh, I attended uh, a government announcement at our local uh, healthcare facility hospital uh, where we're doing a $10 million addition to our OR and MDR units. So uh, I know that we were sent uh, a bit of a, a announcement piece on that. Um, and then also on September 10th, following that, we met with uh, MLA Nixon and Minister Shandro to discuss healthcare professional issues in our area and recruitment and privileging because some of that is still a challenge. That is my report. If there's no questions, we'll look to, for a motion to accept the reports as presented. Councillor Hoven, those in favor? In favor. Thank you. That is carried 7 0. That takes us to 11.56. Do we want to spend the four minutes to quickly go through correspondence, Mr. Reed? He's given me the thumbs up. So let's go through correspondence. Items 11.1 uh, um, through 11.4. Uh, thank you, Reeve Laird. I would suggest these are fairly straightforward items with very little uh, administrative comment. So the first one uh, regarding rural municipalities of Alberta bank swallow recovery strategy feedback. So I believe the RMA has uh, done some good advocacy here. I did not see any action required from this council. Uh, moving to 11.2. And of course, I'm, anytime you want to uh, let me know if I'm going too fast. Um, the Alberta Fish and Game Association uh, sent us this letter regarding information on the Servid Harvesting Preserves Initiative that has uh, come forward from uh, the, just wait, it'll come to me, Elk, the Alberta Elk Commission. And uh, we, on our administrative side, we have not received any information from the Alberta Elk Commission. I do know that other counties have received the request from the Alberta Elk Commission to support them in their request to legalize harvest preserves. Uh, but the document you have in front of you is, uh, I guess, the counterpoint to that. Uh, the AFGA strongly opposes that. So again, I did not see any action required unless council was to suggest some. Um, Village of El Nora, more support of the RCMP. So, uh, you know, we've received many of these. Um, whether or not this council wishes to uh, bring a motion forward to write such a letter is available to you at any given moment or any given council meeting, I suppose. Um, and then the last item, 11.4, the ministerial order number 8006-21 which is um, really completing the process of building a fully coordinated regional response for the three municipalities in the case of an emergency. Um, and so uh, some excellent work done, of course, by Director Haggard and her team. Um, but there it is. Uh, that, that really is for information uh, only. Uh, so if there's no questions, I, I would certainly... Uh, uh, that's all I have to present is what I mean. <laughs> um, Councillor Swanson. Um, and, and maybe this is something, Reed Laird, you can answer for me. Uh, that emergency management, uh, this uh, approval, 
that particular document is a renewable, is this renewable, like, or is this something that's indefinite? I can't remember. Um, uh, and honestly, I can't remember. I believe it is renew renewable, and I believe it's updatable, because at this point, it, unfortunately, um, our neighbors at the town have uh, have opted not to participate in this regional initiative. Um, but it's my understanding that later down the ro road, they could be added as an amendment by the minister to this uh, to this particular document, uh, Mr. Reed. I would only add that it, it doesn't have a time frame, this document. This approval stands now until some change is proposed or delivered to us. Thank you. All right. If there's no other questions, we're looking for a motion to accept correspondence as, correspondence as information. Councillor uh, Lougheed. Figured I need to get you in on the... All right, those in favor? In favor. All right, that is carried 7-0. I believe that brings us right in line with the top of the hour. It's noon, and I think that uh, we can break right there. Will half an hour for lunch work for everybody? All right, 30-minute lunch. We'll see you okay. back at 12.30.
All right, uh, welcome back. We're returning from uh, lunch break. It is 12.40. Um, we have concluded everything up to item number 12 for notices of motion. Do we have any notices of motion? Yeah. Councillor Swanson? Yes, I have one. Um, that council directs administration to bring the final report of the regional governance study with a presentation from the consultants for the October 12th council meeting. Okay, we'll look forward to that. I can email it to you, Tracy. Sorry, I put a coffee in, but it exploded all the things. That then takes us to closed session as there's no uh, no need for a, a vote on notice of motion. So I'm looking for a motion to enter into closed session at 12.42. Councillor Lougheed, sorry. Those in favor? In favor. That's carried, 7-0.
I'll do my normal closing remarks. Thank administration for your continued support and uh, letting folks know that you can find today's meeting highlights and video posted on our website. Our next regular council meeting is scheduled for September 24th, 2020. And again, just a reminder, you should have received your election cards in the mail and please do email and or phone in to register. Again, it's not the Disneyland Fast Pass. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reed, for that little uh, nugget. It will speed up the process on the other end and hopefully make things uh, go a little smoother. We recognize again that COVID cases are continuing to be on the rise in our area and restrictions have been fortified somewhat. So we please ask you to each take your appropriate precautions and stay safe. We're definitely back in the swing of school and fall and all the scheduling that goes with it and the harvest that we are now beginning. I think I believe I said it last week, but I'll repeat it, that Brooker Washington said that nothing ever comes to one that is worth having except as a result of hard work. And nothing could be clearer And we hit September and October and we have the opportunity to get the fruits of our labors and enjoy them as we harvest them. And no one knows that better than our rural community members and I will say our country friends, uh, town friends, who are also harvesting gardens that are hope are bountiful. We hope you have a safe and productive fall harvest. And again, next regular meeting is September the 24th. Looking to adjourn the meeting. Who would like to do that today? Did I say the 24th? And it's actually the 28th. My apologies, September 28th is our next regular meeting. All right, adjournment. Everybody's in a hurry to do that. Deputy Reeve Vandermeer, those in favor? In favor. Okay, that was Jim as well. That is carried.